Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for bringing us here to hear from you and from your word again tonight. And help us to have a good evening after we depart from here. Take what we've learned, apply it to our lives. And these things we ask in your son Paul and Amen. All right. Jenna, how do you feel temperature wise? Okay, I, I clicked it up a couple. Oh, uh, okay. Are you getting hot? I noticed I'm getting hot, yeah. I can take it down more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or I'm taking, I'm taking this down more. It'll be my t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> What is it on? Ah, <laughs> it's a little toasty. Okay. All right. So we left off last week on the um, the theological results of Christ's death on the cross, and we did kind of skim through, and I, I really felt like we shouldn't have done that after the fact. So what we'll do is we'll go through and read at least one passage on each of these. Uh, the theological results and discuss those uh, because really this is the, the essence of it. It's not necessarily, I mean, the historical reality is vitally important, but you must believe the interpretation of his death, the proper interpretation of his death and his person. Otherwise, the atonement is not appropriate. And by that, what I mean is that I use the example of the Pharisees. The Pharisees knew that Christ died on the cross. The Pharisees knew that Yeshua was buried. And the Pharisees knew that He rose from the dead because they paid the soldiers who came and reported to them that He had been raised from the dead and the stone was rolled away. And they told them exactly what happened. And so they paid... They paid the guard, the, the Roman guard that was there guarding the tomb, they paid them to, to say the lie that the disciples came and stole the body. Okay, So they knew that Jesus literally raised from the dead, but they did not believe that He was the Messiah, and they did not believe that His sacrifice was an atoning sacrifice. So they knew the facts, but they didn't believe the substance of the facts. So... This is very important that we understand what what transpired on the cross. So what would make them just so, I guess, naive or just so to everything that's going on? Like, um, is it just uh, because it was in mean, the time of like the Caesars or something, and so they just didn't want to put like they so they grew up with this, they just didn't want to believe all this, even though they're they're watching it. They just thought it was like witchcraft or something. Well, <clears throat> at the end of the day, it's the heart of unbelief. A heart of unbelief. In fact, you remember if you remember the story of, of um, the rich man and Lazarus, and uh, uh, the, the story Jesus tells the story. This is a factual event. There was a rich man. He fared sumptuously. He had, you know, he was rich. Okay. So picture, you know, the Bill Gates mansion, and there's a gate there, and, and here comes this poor man, Lazarus, who's dying. He's got all these sores and wounds on him, and he's dying. And his friends lay him down at the rich man's, uh, at the gate to the rich man's house, or on his porch, I can't remember which one. But anyway, so the rich man could hopefully help him. And the dogs came and are licking his sores, and the rich man did not help him. And Lazarus died, and Lazarus was righteous, and he went to Abraham's bosom, paradise. And the rich man later, he died and went down into Hades. Now prior to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the dead, the dead went into, um, uh, it, was Hades, it was all called Hades, but there was a part of Hades, it was partitioned, it was paradise. And the other part was a place of torment. Now Hades itself is a temporary holding compartment for the dead. When Christ raised from the dead, He opened up paradise and took those spirits out of paradise into heaven. And the reason they had to go into paradise and not directly into heaven was because Christ had not yet shed His blood to cleanse them of their sin. 
so they could not yet enter into the presence of God. So after the resurrection, paradise was opened, and these spirits are now all in heaven. So now when we die, as believers in Christ, we go straight to heaven. Absent for the body, present with the Lord. That's our position right now. So we die, we go right to heaven. So anyway, the rich man at that time, he could see across a chasm, a great gulf. There was a great gulf between paradise and, and Hades, or you know, um, the torment side of torment. <clears throat> and so he cried out, Father Abraham, dip your finger in water and touch my tongue. I'm in torment in these flames. Abraham, he's on the good side. It's called Abraham's bosom or paradise. Abraham said, sorry, Charlie, I can't come across to you. There's a big gulf. I can't do it. Then he says, okay, all right. But can you at least send someone to, to warn my brothers about this place so they won't come to this place? Can you send someone uh, over? And he said, uh, he's got, the, and Abraham answers, says, they got the law and the prophets. Let them read the scriptures. He goes, oh, no, 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 no. They're not going to read those scriptures. <laughs> he says, but, and so Abraham answered and said, even if I sent someone from the raised from the dead, they would not believe. If they will not believe the scriptures, they will not believe though someone are raised from the dead. And so the reality is the unbelieving heart. If God does not touch the unbelieving heart and open the eyes of the unbeliever, it does not matter. They will not believe. That's why you hear people all the time, you know, these atheists. Well, if God did this right now in front of me, I believe. No, you wouldn't. You'd make up an excuse for what happened. You would not believe. So, so it's the hardness of the human heart. Here they know that he rose from the dead. There's no denying it. But they will not believe he's the Messiah. And of course, at that point, what have they seen? They've seen him raise people from the dead. They've seen him heal the sick. They, they couldn't deny his miracles. They couldn't say, oh, he didn't do that. What they had to do was say, oh, no, he does it by the power of Satan. And even to this day, if you read Jewish writings, and I can't remember, I'd have to look it up to specifically which writings they are. They speak of this guy, they sp they're talking about Jesus, and that he had written or etched the four letters of the name of God from the Old Testament on either his arm or his thigh, and that was what gave him power to do the miracles that he did, but he was a sorcerer. And this is in Jewish writing. You can read this today. And that Mary was his mother and all this stuff. They, I think Yehu or something, they, they slightly modify the name to mock the name. So even to this day, they don't deny his miracles. They just attribute his miracles to black magic, the occult, and to Satan. Just like they did then. So it's still in their writings and everything. But that's the nature of the unbelieving heart. So the thing is, if you've believed in Jesus Christ... That is a miracle. That's not something you just take lightly. You know, and say, oh, okay, I believe, but man, my life is really not the way it should be. No, that's a miracle. You've got a miracle of eternal life the moment you believe in Jesus. And it's not it's not in your own wisdom that that can occur. You know? I, uh, which I believe that is true, because even being in my 20s and just going through another phase of my drug life and just wild... Mm -hmm. Just, it's like I always knew Jesus was there. Like even though I'm doing this bad stuff, even though mm -hmm. I still think about Jesus, it has still stopped me from doing certain things. It's God, oh, man, like, dude, you know, like I want to get to heaven, so I can't be doing this stuff. Right. Like, but even though, and I still, I don't know, I still, I still believe in Jesus, uh, even though during those times, and I think that's why I never went to prison because I always just didn't go in the door everybody else did. Yeah. Okay. I get that makes sense. Like once you believe, you believe. That's it. Yeah. Like, it's always like it's always been there for me. Always, even though I was doing stupid stuff. I mean, but it was like right there. It was like, yeah. oh, do I want to? And then the next thought was, you know, like, oh, I better, you know, like. Uh -huh. So I mean, it's, uh, but yeah, you're right. Like once you believe, you believe. There's no. Mm -hmm. And I can see it in other people, like you say, you know, like now it kind of makes sense. Like just the hardest of the hard. They just they don't care. They're just all about. I don't even know what they're about. It's about, yeah. we'd rather just be somebody up for five bucks rather than just go get a job and make 500. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, like they're just rather they're out for the easy stuff and what makes sense right then. Yeah. You know, just, I don't know. 
they're driven by their passions, their lusts, you know, their cravings. They don't want to work. I mean, just you just pick any of the weeds in the garden of the human heart. I mean, it's just there's just a, a ver different variety of you know. The weeds are all nasty, but you know some of them are like, oh, this is your major weed. <laughs> okay. Oh, you got this weed. You got that weed. I had this weed. You know, so. Yeah, well, we can get back on track, but I just, uh, but I just want to say thank you again for just, uh, like I said it before, like me coming here is just to shed a light on my whole past, and, like it didn't make sense, but now it's, it's making, it make, making right. sense now, yeah. but, and it's just, you're, like I said, you're going to want to spell the teach for this stuff, and I don't even know how many times I've been drinking. Well, it's the Holy Spirit, I mean, because people, people can come and sit here and like fall asleep and like, oh, I got nothing out of that and leave, you know, it's the Spirit of God that works. You know, and I'm just thankful that I can be part of that. So, praise God. Amen. All right, so the theological results of his death. It's number one, satisfaction. It means full legal equivalent of wrong done. The full legal equivalent of the wrong done. The point is that the law has been satisfied for what it demanded concerning the wrong done. His death answered all the demands of God's law and justice against the sinner. So let's look at Romans chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. Is that correct? Romans 3, 3 through 4. says, uh, for, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God, the faithfulness of God, without effect? God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. Okay. Uh, this, okay, I'm not really sure the correlation there on that one, unless it's a different translation of some of these words. Let's go to Galatians 1.4. Galatians 1.4. Okay. Galatians 1, 3, and 4. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God and our Father. All right, so he gave himself for our sins. And that's the, the, the vicarious substitution. Uh, that Christ was substituted on our behalf and the wrath that was due us was poured upon Christ and now God is satisfied with that. Uh, there's no more accusation against us even though we continue to sin. Now let me throw this question out. Let's say in my case for example I got saved when I was 16 years old. That's when I came to faith in Jesus Christ that he died on the cross for my sins was buried and raised from the dead that's when God opened my eyes to that reality and I understood it it wasn't just some church thing some saying in church and Jesus and Moses and Noah the Bible people you know um, now here I am I'm 54 and uh, how is it that God I got saved at 16 but I've sinned all the way up to age 54. How is it that I'm still going to heaven? How does this fit in with the, with the fact that I've been sinning since I got saved at the age of 16? Now, I haven't done horrific sins, you know. I mean, I pay my taxes and, you know, tell the truth as much as I can. <laughs> as, as, you know. uh, boy, I don't even want to go there, but... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't intend to lie, but uh, you, sometimes you catch yourself uh, omitting other facts. <laughs> like, why didn't you tell the whole story? But anyway, um, 
So, uh, so why is it that I that God is is satisfied even though I'm still sinning since the moment I believed at age 16? How is He satisfied still? Because that's what Jesus died. Well, He died for our sins, so He can't be punished. It's what it, it can't be punished twice yeah. for it. So, uh, what does that call it? Double jeopardy. Double jeopardy. Yeah, yeah. That's right. You also can't sin enough to lose your sonship. Now, you can lose your fellowship, but you cannot lose your sonship. Yeah. And therefore, that is why we're told that if we do sin, that all we have to do is confess it, and He is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So our fellowship is restored. Yes. Easily. Yeah. So when they say confessions, is it just saying it out loud in prayer, or is you got like one on one with somebody? Like I know the comp like confessions, but you yeah. know, like at night, you know, like when I'm saying my prayers or whatever, if I confess, so it's just between me and him, or is this another human ear has got to hear this? No, it's just you and him. It depends on who you depends on who who you sinned against. Whether you lied to somebody else and need to need to right. confess that, but. Well, as a, as a general rule, no. for for restored fellowship, our confession is to God. So, First John one nine, the application is that we are confessing to God. Let's just like David, when David sinned against God with Bathsheba and killing Uriah the husband of Bathsheba, yeah. his confession in the Psalms was directly to God. So. Uh, when you confess, now, now whether or not, you know, obviously if you did lie to someone, you want to go and make that yeah, horizontal yeah. relationship correct, you know, uh, which is painful, right? To go to someone and say, I lied to you. Yeah. It's very humbling, right? But it's also very humbling to tell God, what I did was wrong. I, said, I lied, I did this. But that's all that's required is to agree with God about what you just did that was a sin. He called it a sin, now I'm calling it a sin too. So, and that's it, you're restored. Your, your, your fellowship, your fellowship is restored. You're not going to sin no more. Yeah, and you're going to sin again and you're going to come back. And that's why Jesus said, <laughs> how many times do you forgive? <laughs> seven times? <laughs> seven no. times seventy. Seventy times seven. <laughs> oh no. There's no counting. Uh. Yeah. So is that what it means here in Romans? Is that uh, that you may be justified in your words, like in prayer, being words, I'm justified, you're justifying it, and then you uh, may overcome when you are judged. Like so. No, let me flip back over there. And I was trying to really skim over that one, and Daniel, you know, right <laughs> <there. laughs> oh, like it's, it's you're just my feet that. to it. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> No, what it's saying here, For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faithfulness of God with no effect? In other words, will a person's unbelief nullify the promises of God? Oh, you didn't believe, so therefore it just shuts down the promise of God. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As is written, that thou, speaking of God, that thou, God, mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So God remains faithful even if we're faithless. His promises do not change because we're faithless. Now I will, as a father, many times, I will say something to my boys or will have said something in the past in particular. And then they will goof around or do something that makes me mad. And I'll say, fine, we're done. We're not, you know that thing I said we're going to do? We're not doing that. I will change what I've said because of their behavior, but God's not that way. That's what he's saying. Yeah, he stays the same today and yesterday and tomorrow is answer. Forever. Forever. So anyone, and, and, and God is precise. So if you believe the gospel, you're going to be saved. No matter what. I mean, he, he does not change his word. He's promised that. He will not change it. He won't say, and this is where theologians come in and they start making things cloudy. Well, yeah, he said believe, but, you know, your life doesn't really measure up to my mind what it should be for a true Christian. So you maybe want to go back and see if you're really saved. 
because y'all don't see the works. And they take something that is not related to salvation, that is not required for salvation, and they try to smush it together. Now they may be right. They may be looking at your life and saying, man, I see this and this and this, and they might be right about that. But it doesn't change the requirement of salvation. And God's not going to say, you know what, I'm taking salvation away because you haven't cleaned up your life in this area. No, He's faithful. Let God be true and every man a liar. I told you I'd save you if you believed and you believe. Now you've got other issues that I'm going to have to discipline, bring discipline into your life. And when we stand before the Bema seat of Christ, the judgment bar of Christ, where we're rewarded for our works, it's not about salvation, but the work that we've done, Christ is going to reward us for what we've done for Him in, our, in this body. Is that where we get our levels? Or, uh, when we go to heaven, like we get like different kingdoms? Or, does that make me say, like, like, so, like, obviously you're going to be higher on the totem pole as me, but, like, there is, like, a totem pole. <laughs> <laughs> there's, no, there's no guarantee of that. Is that where that comes into play? Like, uh, when you go up before God and then he, like, talks about your works or whatever, is that, is there different levels in heaven? Well, it's not different levels in heaven in the it's sense different. of, like, the Mormon concept. You know, like, right. oh, I'm, tra I'm trapped in this lower level. I really wanted to get up to there, but I can't get up there because yeah. I was bad. See, that didn't make sense to no. me, the whole celestial, like the whole different... That's nonsense. That's yeah. it's from hell. It's a lie from hell. So, what it, what it means is, say we're all, we're all citizens. Uh, let's say that everyone from Ogden, Utah, everyone that lives in Ogden came to church tonight. We would have the mayor... The mayor would be here. I mean, if everyone had lived in Ogden. Oh, yeah, yeah, now I remember. Yeah, you're saying there's going to be somebody, a priest that is over this many people, or, okay, now I see. Yeah, thing. you'll have the dog catcher, the mayor, a police officer, you know, a, a, maybe a, a colonel in the Air Force, you know, okay, yeah, homeless yeah. people, but they're all citizens, right? Police. So that, that's, we're going to be rewarded and have responsibility in the kingdom, you know, according to the works that we've done, and crowns and... So yeah. That's where I didn't get the whole LDS stuff. Is there's different kingdoms. It's like, well, how do I get to there? Do I have to like wash your car twice a week? You know, type of stuff. That's what didn't make sense. That's why I, yeah. I mean, like, that's what I don't. That's I got lost. That's why I probably couldn't understand. You know, I'm just so lost. I don't even, I don't even know. But like here, it's like straight to the point. This is it. It's, it's all like. Well, <laughs> the dirty secret is they're all lost too. They don't really think about it. It's a. Uh, they don't really think it through. And those who do think about it. In fact, where was I at? I heard this great saying. Someone told me this, and they, they said, I started to think, and I said, <laughs> there you go. That was the problem. You started to think. So if a Mormon starts to think, they're going to at least leave Mormonism. If they keep thinking, they will ultimately leave Mormonism. But what they do is, they just suppress it. They don't think about it. They don't want to think about it. That's why they don't want to talk about these things. You get into a detailed... Let's, let's dig deep in your doctrine. Let's see if it's true. They don't like to do it. And here's their ultimate shield. When you speak it, the truth to them and you ask them powerful questions that are embarrassing and they can't answer, what do they do? Sheen! They pull up the shield of their testimony. I believe that Joseph Smith is a prophet and that this is the one true church. That's just all I can say. So I'm out of here. Really? That's your best law? That's your wow. shield of defense? Wow. So is that just, uh, so in all reality, so the reason why I'm not going to Mormon church no more is because it's just, that's God telling me, like, hey, you're doing something like this. This, this is the truth. And that's yeah. probably why I'm paying attention. Yeah, that's a cult. They're a cult. They are a cult. They're not Christians at all. They are a cult, a counterfeit. I mean, all religions are. They're, they're, they're all man made. You know? Yeah, see, I was, I was just there with my family, but I'm here. Personal to relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so in this text, it's, it's saying God is true. If God has said it and you take God at His word, then He's going to respond according to His word. It doesn't matter if over in this other area you're not, you know, taking God at His word. Okay, because believers, we, you know, we struggle in the flesh. We struggle. We make foolish decisions. We don't walk with Christ as we should, you know. And we make a mistake or a sin here and there and and, and we're all, you know, like this. And, uh, <clears throat> but God is faithful. If you take God at His word at any given point, then He'll be faithful to honor that word. 
regardless of what else is going on over here. He won't say, well, yeah, I know I made that promise, but what you're doing over there, see, uh-uh, that don't count. So I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to be faithful to what I said. Oh, no, he's faithful. You take him at his word, he'll prove himself faithful. And what that does is it causes you to want to trust him more and more in other areas. Yeah, I've noticed a well, lot. Like I've downloaded the Bible on my phone and... Yeah. I did a uh, well, Robert here has got me going. He's sending me scriptures, and now I'm like, yeah. you know, so it's like the seed is definitely growing inside me. Now that yeah. I actually see the light, and I'm like, yay! You know, like, and I like to start asking more questions. Yeah. Stuff. I like Sidetrack us a lot, but I love it though. This is this is learning. This is what it's all about: fellowship and learning. This is it. And it sharpens me. Like I said, I wanted to skim over this. <laughs> I, I, I know what the text says. I'm not understanding no, how, yeah. how he connects it with the satisfaction. Um, in fact, let's, let's, let's go to a satisfaction verse I do know about. Let's look at Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verse, um, verse 11. This is my kind of clarity here. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 11. Somebody want to read that? He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Okay. So very clearly, this word satisfied is used in the text. And this is written about 750 B.C., before Christ. And it is one of the most powerful Old Testament, most vivid, powerful Old Testament passages that um, depict Christ projecting prophetically into the future what Messiah would do. So verse 11 says, He, which is speaking of the Father, He shall see the travail or the labor. Uh, let's see, what do I have here? Is that a parallel 11? The distress. He shall see the travail or the distress of his soul, the son. The father shall see the travail of the soul of the son and shall be satisfied. So when Christ died on the cross and the father looked upon that sacrifice of his only begotten son, it satisfied all of his wrath against all humanity. The travail of one man, Jesus the Messiah, on the cross, it appeased the Father for all the sins of humanity. Not by looking at our lives. He says, I'm gonna watch, I'm gonna watch Dan now for a little while and see if I'm he satisfies me. No, thank God he's not doing that. He looked at the travail of Jesus Christ. And that travail, as the wrath was poured upon him, it satisfied his wrath for all mankind. And now notice what the, the text continues says. It says, by his knowledge, see this is so clear, by his knowledge, by the knowledge of the Son, shall my righteous servant, Jesus, justify many. So according to this verse, what is it that allows the Son to justify many? What does it say in that passage that, that, that says, if, if, I, if a person possesses this, then he will be justified by the righteous servant of Jehovah, which is Jesus. What is it? What must I do for God to justify me? That I be counted as those justified, the many that God has justified. Believe. Believe. But what's the word in the text? You're right, but what is the word in the Old Testament there? Other iniquity. Righteousness? Um, back up. Okay, after the word satisfied. Read after the word satisfied. By his knowledge. By his knowledge. By the knowledge of the Son of God. You'll be justified. And that's what faith is. Faith is the knowledge of the Son of God. Without seeing Him. So now turn over to John chapter 17. Verse 3. <laughs> I 
I can't believe. Look at this. I used a Sharpie pen <laughs> in my Bible, and I've ruined John 17. <laughs> it bleeds through. Anyway, John 17, 3. And this is eternal life, life eternal, that they they might know that the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Okay. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. See, that's, that's the beauty of saving faith. It is, the veil is lifted off of Jesus Christ. You see Him in truth. You see His death as satisfying the Father, His burial, His resurrection, has all satisfied the wrath of God against you. And you receive eternal life the moment you believe that or have that knowledge transferred into your heart and mind. You're conscious of it. That knowledge, it is that knowledge, that faith, which is a synonym, that God counts as righteousness. It's not the things that we do, it's, it's who we know. Do you know Him? And so, you know, a lot of times we search for a mystical thing. So if I simply said, and I'll throw the question out, how many people know Jesus Christ in this room? Do you know Jesus Christ? If you know Jesus Christ, raise your hand. I know, uh, I'm learning. Okay. Knowing. Okay. <laughs> All right. See, now, now this is the good point. This is what I wanted to draw out. Um, because we're thinking, oh, this mystical thing. I haven't had that mystical thing yet. i got to have that mystical thing. To know him. Do you really? But do you know him? That's not what the scriptures teach. Okay. Who's brave in here who is willing to tell me what it means to know Him? What does that mean, to know Him? Do you know Him? Now, y'all raised your hands. Huh. But now, what does it mean to say, I know Him? Jana gave me a hands up. <laughs> Jana, the PW. Now, hopefully, you catch all this on the audio. You mean turn the camera on you? <laughs> <laughs> Woo, here we go. If you believe. Okay, if you believe, you know him. That's correct. What do you believe? That he died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose on the third day. Okay, what about his person? That he is God. That he's God. That's it. Is, that the, is what she said true? Are those things factually yes. true? Yes. 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 Okay, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you say, uh-uh, no, 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 that was, you got some good things in there, but that's not right. Because Jesus is not God. He is the Son of God, see? Ah, ha, 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 ha. he's the Son of God, he's not God. And his death on the cross covered the basic sins, but if you keep sinning, God's not satisfied if you keep sinning. See, that's from someone, they, you don't know God, do you? Well, then how can how can they say like yeah he's the son of God but how can they like argue that even though he sits in the right hand of God he's on his level you know like that's I mean how can they argue like unbelief they don't know him see that's the thing they don't know him so it'd be like someone came up to Jana said you married to Ron Tabor yes I am oh Ron Tabor oh we go way back really who are you oh my name's Bob. Yeah, Ron Tabor. I remember him when he was playing in the uh, 1972 Olympics. He was on the basketball team. Boy, he had a beautiful... He could slam dunk that ball every time. Every score he had in that Olympic game. Remember that? He was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's not my husband. He's like 5'6". He's <laughs> okay. Uh, that's not him. Yeah, Ron Tabor, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. 
And he had, uh, he had those uh, three, uh, three little girls. I remember, you guys have three little girls? And they, no, no. So that's what they're saying when they come up and they say, Oh, I believe, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, yeah. Jesus, oh, really? I love Jesus. I do too, I love Jesus. Tell me about him. Oh, he's Michael the Archangel, the first created being of Heavenly Father, Jehovah God. <laughs> No, that's not Jesus. Yeah, yeah, he is. He's, he created everything else after God made him. No, that's not Jesus. See, he doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't know what Janus said. He's the Son of God. That means he's God. He's God in human flesh. He's the Son of Man. He's the Son of God. He is God in human flesh. Oh, no, no. He's Michael the Archangel. <coughs> Get a Mormon in here. Do you know Jesus? Oh, yes. Do you love him? Oh, of course I do. A tear comes down. <laughs> of course I love him. See my tears? Okay, well, who is he? Oh, he is the spirit brother of Lucifer. First spirit baby of Elohim and one of his harem wives. <laughs> you don't know him either, do you? <laughs> the problem with the church today is We've allowed mysticism to creep in, and we're like, oh, that's too easy. i got to know it. Oh, God, let me know you. Let me know you. Now, there is a sense that's an appropriate prayer for a believer because we know more and more intimately. Uh, we, we, we grow in our knowledge of Him and trust Him more and more as we, as we walk with Him. But the fundamental knowledge of who He is is, is undeniable to the, to the saved. And it's not a feeling, it's not a mystical, you know, until I have the dream, or until I have the vision, or until he comes into my room and talks with me face to face. No, 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 do not look for any of those things. Open the book and commune with him. This is how you know him. He speaks out of this book. It's a living book. It's not a dead, dry book like a novel or something. Like, I've read that, I don't need to read it again. I mean, I'm reading through the scriptures again. I started in Deuteronomy and like, Lord, oh my, there's this, this truth was just flying out of the text. Like, oh Lord, I got to write this down, you know. And uh, so it's the simplicity of knowing Him is who is He? What did He do? You either know that or you don't know it. Jana knows me. She knows. And really, if, when you say you're gonna, you know somebody. There's a difference between. I know about him, and I know him. To know about someone is to have an assortment of facts about a person. From somebody else. Well, it could be from somebody else. Um, but you, you've got a, a set of facts about the person. But to know the person is to know their inside. Okay? Like, I know about, let's say, LeBron James. I know about LeBron James. He is a basketball star. He's got four rings. He's wealthy, blah, blah, blah. I know about him. But I really don't know him. Now, if you were to come in here and I say, LeBron, I know how you love, pa 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 pa. I'm going to go get it out of the fridge for you. I don't know that about him. Or if someone comes in and, and, and steps on his pet peeve to go, oh, LeBron ain't going to like that. <laughs> I don't know LeBron. I don't know what ticks him off. I don't know what makes him happy. I don't know him. I just know about him. So with Christ, I know him. He's not just a historical figure in a book. He's the Savior of the world. He's the Son of God. He is this, the, he's God in human flesh who's a death on the cross and resurrection, which is fact, has satisfied the wrath of the Father in heaven. And if I want to know the Father in heaven, all I've got to do is look at Jesus Christ and I know the Father. If I know the Son, I know the Father. Because they're one. He's not different. Like I said before, it's not as though Jesus, uh, Jesus is going to take... Come on, Ron. Father, I want to introduce Ron to you. Come on, it's okay. Come, come on, Ron. Remember when I told you he didn't like this and this. Here he is, Father. And the Father's like, I don't know if I like you or not. No, if the Son loves me, the Father loves me. If the Father loves me, the Son loves me. There's no, I'm going to win him over to you. That's what Roman Catholicism teaches with praying to Mary. 
See, Mary kind of softens the blow to, you know, to Jesus. And she has the heart of Jesus. You don't. But she has the heart of Jesus. She'll soften him up and, and make it more like he'll accept you. No, that's not how it works. So, uh, I don't know where I've gotten off on all this. But that's the simplicity of what Janice said. If you believe in Jesus Christ, then guess what? You know Him. That's a synonym. You know who He is. So when someone comes up and says, like a Jehovah's Witness, no, nah, He's Michael the Archangel. No, He's not. You don't know Him. You clearly do not know Christ. You think you know Christ, but you don't. It's not a feeling. It's not a mystical experience you look back to. You either know Him or you don't. He's, a, he's God in human flesh who died for our sins and raised from the dead. Or He's something else. <laughs> so I should I guess I could answer this. Yeah, I know Jesus. I know He died for me, and I know that He died for my sins, and therefore I know I believe in Him. Yeah. So I know that I'm going to heaven. You I know, do know I know His promise. And Amen. Do you know it? In fact, this is really encouraging. Look at John 14. See this? We're, we just added now six months to our study. <laughs> 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 but that's okay. <laughs> John, John chapter 14, let's look at this. <clears throat> verse, go down to verse 7. Read verse 7 through 9. John 14, John 14 verse 7 through 9. Someone read that out loud. If you had known me, you should know you should have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. <laughs> Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it suffices us. Read verse 19. Jesus said to him, Have I been so long time without you, and yet have you not known me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. And how say you then, show us the Father? Okay, beautiful. So, Jesus says, now remember, to know the Father and the Son is eternal life. So Jesus says here in verse 7, If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip says unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us, or it satis that'll satisfy. That's all we need, Lord. Just show us the Father, and we'll, we'll, that's enough. Uh, uh, Jesus says, Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. How sayest thou, then, show us the Father? Now the beauty of this passage is he's describing you, Dan. You are Philip. Philip didn't know what he knew. Philip didn't know what he knew. He's like, okay, Lord, just show us the Father and then I'll know him. He's like, Philip, do you know me? Yeah. Then you know the Father. <laughs> it's that simple. But Philip didn't know what he knew. And Jesus says... If you had known me, you should have known my Father also. Do you know me, Philip? And from henceforth, now listen, this is the authority of Jesus Christ. From henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Jesus is telling him what he knows, but he just doesn't believe it. Jesus is telling him, from now on, this is the Lord Jesus Christ, God in human flesh, is telling him, uh, don't contradict me, Philip. You know him. Well, uh, just show him to, him to me, and then that'll be enough. You didn't hear what I said. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Therefore, you know him. From now on, you know him. So, <laughs> Jesus said, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me? The answer is no. 
You know who I am, Philip. Okay. He that has seen me has seen the Father. So how sayest you then, show us the Father? I'm telling you, you know the Father because you know me. And Philip just wasn't getting it, you know. But Philip knew God. He's, he's in heaven. He has eternal life. And we do too. We know Jesus Christ. We know the Father. We have eternal life. And all the minutiae of life and the habits and the things that we have that we have going on in our lives that are struggles and difficulties and groanings and, and failures and stumblings and sins and confessions and all those things have no bearing on eternal life. No bearing! Because again, we come back full circle. Because God's satisfaction is not with our lives. It is with the suffering, the travail of the soul of the Son of God. That's what he was looking at. That's what he gazed upon and said, I'm satisfied. It is finished indeed. When Jesus bowed his head and said, Tetelestai, paid in full, it's finished. And the Father said, Amen. And how do we know? How do we know? This will be our closing quiz. How do we know that the Father said, Amen, it's finished? How do we know it? Because he was raised from the dead. Bingo! That is the correct answer, because he was raised from the dead. What would it mean if he stayed in the tomb, Phil? If he was still dead, then we would still be within our, in our sins. Why? Why? What would it mean to Jesus, though? That's true of us. What would it mean about Jesus if he were still in the grave? That he messed up someone. That's right. That he was punished for his sins. He had sins that he's being punished for. He was a sinner. Just like every other sinner, he's still in the grave. But his resurrection proved that God was satisfied and that he really did pay for our sins, not his own sins. And so, praise God. I mean, that's, that's powerful. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 4, uh, that Paul, Paul says, uh, I'll read this and close on this. Romans 1, verse 4. says, uh, I'll go back to verse 3. Concerning His Son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, in other words, He came through the lineage of King David, He is made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. The Spirit of holiness, He's the Son of God, is declared with power. Okay. Could you expect anything less than someone who said, I am the Son of God? If you can't raise yourself from the dead, then you're not the Son of God. <laughs> right? Um, Worse than that, he said, I am the Father of one. So if yeah. he's not one with the Father and can't raise himself, then you've got to there you go. Then you've indicted the entire God. The, the Godhead has entirely been indicted. It's yes. unable to raise this man from the dead. Yeah. That's deep, deep thinking here. That's good. So his resurrection assures us that God was satisfied. It is paid in full. So you don't have to stay in the grave anymore. You can come on out. And that's why we'll come out because his satisfaction is upon us. That's why we'll be raised. We'll be up in the rapture. Regardless if we had a good week or a bad week. Praise God. That's good news, right? It's good yes. news. Yes. Yeah. That's good. All right. Let's close in prayer. Rob, will you close in prayer? Father God, we come before you at this time through your mighty, mighty, mighty Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We thank you for this wonderful sermon that we learned this evening. We ask that you continue reminding us of it, giving us your hope and your truth in our lives, each one of our, us here, the congregation, to continue lifting our heads and our eyes to continue going forward in these last days as you are pouring out your Spirit upon all flesh. Let us be there for your other people, Lord Jesus. You lead and we shall follow the best that we possibly can. In your mighty name we pray. Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Amen and amen.